Hey, Steve Gaming, what's up, buddy? All right, we are in countdown mode here. This is my first time ever live streaming an event, so I really have very little idea of what I'm doing here. What's up, Elijah? So for those of you who are already here, basically the way this is going to work is when the event goes live, I will mostly only be responding through chat because I don't want to be interrupting what's going on there. Uh, we're watching this through Facebook right now, and it's going live in three minutes. What's up, Darth? So, I mean, I I feel kind of weird about this. <laughs> I, I feel like they kind of already gave all the quest details I was waiting for. So I'm hyped to see what some of the games are going to be uh, and stuff like that. But for the most part, I just I have no idea. What's up, Steak? I have no idea what to expect from this because they already kind of gave away all the information about the quest. So I guess we're going to see if this gets confirmed. We're going to see what's happening with venues. What's up, Oliver, Nova, Natalie? And then uh, from there, I I don't know. I'm hoping maybe they had maybe they've got some other surprises in the gate for us. But usually the keynote is about an hour, so we'll be watching. And again, I'll be responding once it starts, mostly through cha uh, chat instead of live on the screen, unless there's a little break. Hey, Kitty Cat VR, what's up? Uh, good job. I saw you got your link up on your Instagram. Uh, yeah. So. This should be really, hopefully, there's going to be some surprises. Hopefully, they didn't give everything away already this week. But if they did, I mean, we all are blown away by the the information we got about the quest anyways. So, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, hey, Larna, what's up? And we got lots of people stopping in here. So, uh, for everybody who still is popping in and didn't hear this before, I will probably, once the keynote starts, mostly be responding through chat. Uh, I'll be here with you. And then if there's a break, we will discuss some during that or we'll discuss after. I just don't want to be interrupting them while they're going. So, I'll switch over to the keyboard and probably mute my mic for most of the event while it's happening. And hopefully, I this uh, this Jurassic Park VR, I hope we get some details about that. Oh, thank you. I don't have my... Uh, other monitor up so I can't actually see how many people are here. This is my first time ever streaming a live event like this, so I have I have no idea what to expect here. We've got three likes and six people sitting here waiting with me. I know a lot of people are going to be watching some of the big channels that were already set up ahead of time uh, for this stream too, so I expect this to be a small and fun chat. <laughs> this is a demo. This is not a demo tree. I expect this to be a, a little less crazy. I'm going to turn my mic volume down a bit just so I'm not blowing out the mic. So let me know how that sounds now if it's still loud enough. <sighs> All right, 40 seconds. I am I'm I it's bittersweet. I'm like super excited, but at the same time I'm like all this stuff that Facebook is doing with the privacy stuff and everything. I'm like, "Uh, oh, maybe maybe this is not <laughs> Maybe this is not as exciting of an event as I want it to be. I, I want to be super pumped about this. I know a lot of people are asking, Larna, thank you so much. Thank you for the donation. I really appreciate that. You are awesome. You've been so supportive of the channel. All right. We're about to go in. So I will probably mute my mic at least once it gets started, but I will continue responding through the chat here. So. you're all doing well and thanks for tuning in to Facebook Connect. For those of you joining for the first time, Connect is usually our big conference with developers coming together from all over the world as we show off the latest in virtual and augmented reality. Now things are a little different this year, but we've got some exciting new things to show you and I'm really looking forward to it. But first, I just want to say that I hope you are all staying healthy, safe, and good during this time. For a lot of us, COVID means living more of our lives online. Going to school, working, hanging out with friends. More is happening online now, but, but it's not quite the same. Most of us have been on video calls where people keep talking over each other, and staring at a grid of faces for hours just isn't always the most natural way to interact. What we're missing is this feeling of presence. The feeling of actually being right there with someone else, with all of the different sensations that that includes. 
So that's what the whole fields of virtual and augmented reality are about, delivering that sense of presence. And that's why a lot of people have been spending more time in VR since COVID hit. I know I have. You know, it's a way to get out there even when you can't leave your house and to see your friends and feel connected even when you're physically apart. And with all the heaviness in the world this year, it's also a way to have some fun and, and find some moments of joy. I've definitely been playing a lot more with, with friends recently, especially games like Echo VR, which is, is kind of like playing full contact Frisbee in zero gravity space, uh, or Arizona Sunshine, where you can stand back to back with your friends as you fight off wave after wave of zombies. I've also been enjoying Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, which is this great party game where you're in VR and you have to defuse a bomb with the help of your friends who are outside of VR and uh, they're helping you solve the bomb's puzzles. And it gets hilarious pretty quickly depending on how helpful uh, or not uh, your friends are. Now, if you've tried experiences like this, uh, you know just how magical it is to be together in one of these worlds with your friends. And, as the ecosystem keeps growing and the hardware keeps getting better and better, we're starting to see how whole new categories of experiences could take place in VR in the future. So I'm looking forward to showing you what we've been working on, but before we dive in, you may have noticed that this event got a new name, Facebook Connect, and it's brought to you by a new group, Facebook Reality Labs. And that's because this work to build the next computing platform, to deliver that sense of presence and immersion, and to make it the best platform for connecting with people you care about. That work increasingly requires us to extend beyond just our Oculus virtual reality product lines to include a lot more of the work that we're doing into augmented reality, into all kinds of long-term research, into more natural interactions like neural interfaces, uh, into home and other wearable devices, and into software development, like what we're doing with Horizon and what we have done for the whole history of our company. So uh, we have one group that pulled together all of our augmented reality and virtual reality efforts, which we are calling Facebook Reality Labs. And now we also have one event to discuss all of this work, which we're calling Facebook Connect. Our goal is to deliver the products and technology that let you feel like you're together with the people you want, no matter where you are or the physical distance between you. So today, we're gonna talk about how we're going to get there. Now first, let's talk about augmented reality. The goal here is to develop some normal size, nice looking glasses uh, that you can wear all day and interact with holograms, digital objects, and information uh, while still being present with the people and world around you. Maybe you want to just sit on your couch and have a friend teleport and have their hologram sit right next to you to play games or just talk or hang out. You know, maybe you're walking somewhere and you want directions or you see something awesome and you want to share it without having to take out your phone. Maybe you don't want to have to carry your phone around at all or have to worry about having it take you away from the moment. You're going to be able to do all of this with a pair of glasses. Now, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on some of the foundational technologies. Later today, uh, we're going to share more about Project ARIA, which is the first research device that we're going to be putting out into the world to help us understand the software and hardware needed to build our first consumer augmented reality glasses. And we're starting to put together all the different building blocks, including the, the input systems, the display systems, spatial audio. We have a team of computational neuroscientists and engineers working on non-invasive neural interfaces and ways to use subtle gestures to control augmented reality objects in the world. There's still hard problems to solve, but this has the opportunity to open up a lot of new ways for people to connect, to work, learn, and play in the future. And we now have line of sight into how we're gonna get there in the coming years. Now, in the meantime, uh, there's a lot that we can do today with the technology that we've already created in order to develop great smart glasses. They're not yet augmented reality glasses, but they're on the road there. So a couple of years ago, I started meeting with some of the best eyeglasses makers around the world. And, and this journey took me to Milan, where I met with the founder of a company called Essilor Luxottica. They're the best in the world at making glasses, and they make Ray-Ban and Oakley, and they design and build frames for everyone from Armani to Versace. And after spending time with their team and visiting their factory, I knew that they were the right partner for us to help bring the best technology together with the best glasses. And of course, in the future, 
you know, people aren't all going to wear one or two different styles of glasses, uh, like we just have a couple of different kinds of phones. So we need to support a lot of different designs and styles, and that's what Luxottica does. Now, we don't have a product yet to share with you today, but I am excited to share that we have formed a multi-year partnership, starting with building and releasing our first pair of smart glasses next year. Now, I can't go into full product details yet, uh, but they're gonna be the next step on the road to augmented reality glasses, and they look pretty good too. So here's a quick video that our team put together. Augmented reality glasses. Introducing the glasses <laughs> of the future. Cutting edge technology ahead of its time. The eyewear of tomorrow. Aiding the cause of science. Inching my way towards the future. I wish I could see out of this thing. All right, so this is going to be a big milestone in starting to integrate the core technologies into a regular glasses form factor and seeing how people use them. And speaking of that, the most important part of any AR product is the experiences it can deliver. And I'm happy with how the AR software ecosystem is coming together too. More than 600 million people use AR across our apps and devices every month. People are creating some really awesome things with Spark AR, which anyone can use to build AR effects for Facebook and Instagram. There's also AR shopping technology that lets you see how furniture is going to look in your room, or how makeup or glasses are going to look on your face before you buy them. We're already seeing some of the creativity that augmented reality can unlock, and I think that this is all just going to get a lot better as AR starts to become even more mainstream. Now, Let's talk about virtual reality. We are continuing to build out the Quest platform with better hardware, software, and content, and we're starting to see more areas where VR provides a clearly better experience than other platforms. So take gaming. You know, I think Quest is already the best VR gaming platform, but it's about to get a lot better because a couple of years ago, we started working with some of the best game studios to produce AAA franchises for Quest, and today, uh, we're going to share some of this work from developers like Respawn, ILM XLab, Universal Games, and more. And we're continuing to bring even more of these games to Quest. This fall, Oculus Link is coming out of beta. And Oculus Link allows you to use a compatible gaming PC to play Rift titles on Quest. In the future, it's going to support 90 hertz for PC gameplay. And we're working on a new UI, so you're going to be able to find all of your PC games right alongside your Quest apps all in one place. So that's coming next year, and it will give you access to a lot of native Quest features while you are using Link. Another important area is social products. We're building new social experiences like Horizon, which is now an invite-only beta, and it lets you create your own worlds where you can go and hang out with your friends. We're also building experiences like Venues, which I know a lot of you are using right now to watch this live stream. And I'm really focused on, on this area of, of social software because, as I've said a few times, I think that augmented and virtual reality are going to be the most social platforms ever. And we're really just scratching the surface on this right now. We're also seeing how VR can change work. Some of our Oculus teams already have their meetings in VR. And since COVID, I held my first management team meeting entirely in VR too. And I have to say, in some ways, it already felt more real than a video call because we had a shared sense of space. You know, I always find uh, that I have a harder time remembering discussions on video calls uh, because from a visual and auditory perspective, there's no shared sense of space. Everything just looks flat. But in VR, even before we have avatars with full fidelity and facial expressions, just having that shared visual sense of space and spatial audio, uh, that for everyone else in the room, the room and people's locations looks the same to everyone else, um, you can hear where someone's talking from, it just makes a huge difference. Now, more people are gonna work remotely in the future. Now, I think that VR is going to give you the ability to work from anywhere without having to feel a lot of that separation that current remote work setups bring. You know, Facebook has already said that for our company, we expect 50% of our employees to work remotely long-term. 
So we're invested in building out the tools that we need for our own people to work from anywhere, and then we're going to deliver them to the world. There are other advantages to VR for work too. Like you can design your own perfect workstation with infinite screen space and ability to teleport between different teams and projects easily. So we'll cover all of this and more in the rest of the session today. Uh, but before I sign off, I want to show you something new that we've been working on. And for this, uh, we're going to need Boz, who heads up Facebook Reality Labs. Uh, I've been keeping him pretty busy during this lockdown, and here's a quick summary of some of our conversations over the last period. Really, Mark? I mean, that's five in a row. I told you I've had a lot of practice. Been spending a lot more time in VR. Does he ever sleep? You know, Quest is awesome, but I've been thinking, you know, people love it, but there are a few places where we could make, make it, it better. better. I mean, the screen's great, but I wonder if we could get 50% more pixels in there to make it even crisper. Uh, yeah, I'll see what I can do. Uh, this is why I always lose in Echo Arena. Taylor, Mark wants to know if we can make the screen more crisp. Yeah, we can do that. We could throw in a single high-res LCD panel. Great. But let's make sure we keep the built-in IPD adjustment. Got it. But keep the built-in IPD adjustment, of course. We can keep the built-in IPD adjustment? It's never been done before with a single panel, but we'll see what we can do. Okay. I also think we could try to make the whole thing lighter. Let's try to cut 10% off the weight. Could we put it on a diet? Yeah, I think we could shave a few grams. You got it, Mark. Leslie thinks we can shave off a few grams. All right, one more thing. We've got to make the next version a lot more powerful. Let's see if we can advance the processor by a couple of generations and maybe add more memory? Ciao, my buddy, my man. What about that new VR-dedicated processor we've been working on with Qualcomm? The Snapdragon XI2? That is not an easy ask. We're talking about an entirely new architecture. Mark, you're, you're on mute. If the team can pull this off, I think we're going to have something really great here. Well, we're wondering if we could try out one more thing. This is yeah, so bad. We have an idea. What if? We lower the price. Yeah, great idea. <laughs> what are you thinking, 350? Mark, come on, man. All right, all right. I'll think about it. See you guys soon. So that's a pretty big to-do list. But we want the next version of Quest to be another big step forward. You know, we want virtual reality to be something that anyone can just jump into with the best and most immersive experiences out there. And we want it to be available to as many people as possible. Quest was a big step towards that goal. For the first time, you had real virtual reality with full freedom of movement so you could walk around with no wires to break that feeling of presence. And from day one, we were selling them as fast as we could make them. More than 90% of people who used Quest this year hadn't used an Oculus before. This is the form factor that's going to introduce people to virtual reality. And today, we are taking the next big step forward. And I'm excited to share with all of you Oculus Quest 2. Quest 2 has our highest resolution display ever with 50% more pixels. It's more powerful with a custom Qualcomm Snapdragon XR2 processor and six gigs of memory. It weighs 10% less than the original Quest and has a new soft strap, so it's even easier to carry around. It has new touch controllers that are more ergonomic and have battery life improvements. It is shipping on October 13th, and we are opening pre-orders today. And it starts at just $299. The team has done an incredible job, and I am really proud of what we've built here. Quest 2 is lighter, faster, and has a better display than the first generation, and it's $100 more affordable. It is fully wireless, and it has hands down the best content library of any VR system out there. Now, there are a bunch of improvements that we've made to the hardware. 
We've been working on this with Qualcomm for years, and Quest 2 is the first major consumer device that runs on the Snapdragon XR2 platform. It's fully customized for VR and AR, with support for multiple cameras and technology like fixed foveated rendering. And the end result is a more immersive experience with crisper graphics, more dynamic environments, and ultimately, just a more realistic feeling of presence. The display is better. Instead of two OLEDs, Quest 2 has a single LCD for super high resolution visuals, and a new system for adjusting the optics that makes it easier to dial in the visual settings that are right for you. We've redesigned the touch controllers with more efficient tracking and optimized haptics. The new controllers deliver a better feeling of hand presence and stronger physical feedback. And for apps that don't use our full hand tracking, this is gonna make a better experience all around. And we've also been making a lot of software updates too. For example, you know, a lot of people have been using VR uh, for fitness. It's probably one of the most fun ways to get in some quick cardio. And you know, I mean, Beat Saber is, is a bit more motivating than a treadmill most mornings. So we've built in a system level fitness tracker that helps you keep tabs on just how much exercise you're getting while playing some of your favorite titles. It's called Oculus Move, and it lets you set VR fitness goals and track them across different games and apps. And we're also experimenting with real-time stats and in-game overlays, and we're gonna start testing this out on Quest later this year. Now, these are just a few of the improvements that make Quest 2 the best all-in-one VR experience out there. And I've really been enjoying using mine during this lockdown, and I'm looking forward to getting these in more of your hands in just a few weeks. Now, I wanna make sure that I give a special shout out to everyone in our developer community and all of you who've been on this journey with us. Now, five months ago, uh, we shared that there were 10 developers who had made more than $2 million in revenue from Quest content alone. And today, there are more than 35 different titles on Quest that generate revenue in the millions of dollars. People have spent more than $150 million on Quest content. This ecosystem is growing. And now, with Quest 2 priced at just $299, a lot more people are going to be able to experience VR soon. So this is becoming a self-sustaining ecosystem now, and a lot of the success comes down to developers building great experiences. Because every time that someone gasps out loud when they see their hands in VR, um, or instinctively ducks or dodges something, you know, that's the result of all the effort that you put in. So, so I wanna thank all of you because we are on this mission together. Now, walking the floor at Connect and, and getting uh, to demo some of the new experiences that you've all built, um, that was awesome. And I hope we're gonna be able to do that and get together in person again one day soon. Uh, but I also hope that together, uh, we can build something that, that helps us stay connected even when we are on different continents. Something that, that can help us feel present no matter where we are. You know, that's what technology should be all about and it is something that virtual reality can uniquely help us accomplish. So if we can build experiences that are as vivid and meaningful as being there together in person, now that's gonna unlock a lot of amazing things. It's gonna mean that you're free to live and work and learn anywhere you want, to meet friends in new places, to explore and create new worlds. For the first time, we're going to be able to step outside the limits of the physical world and experience things and be part of communities that weren't even possible before. And I can't wait to create this with all of you. And now, to talk more about the journey ahead, I'm going to hand it off to Boz. Thanks, Mark. At Facebook Reality Labs, we often say that we see AR and VR as the next step in computer evolution. From mainframes to desktops, desktops to laptops, and laptops to smartphones, these are what comes next. But why? Why do we say that? What right do we have to make that claim? And the answer, I think, goes to the very heart of what computers are and what they're for, and why a social media company acquired a virtual reality company, and why our VR conference is called Connect in the first place. I mean, everyone knows that computers are, are useful. I mean, they help us accomplish tasks more efficiently and, and accurately. But from the very beginning, they've also had another important purpose, to connect people. An early computer scientist to make this case was Doug Engelbart, famous for the mother of all demos, where he debuted things like the mouse, the graphical user interface, and hyperlinked text. 
but he also debuted shared document editing and even video conferencing way back in 1968. Along with his friend Stuart Brand, Engelbart understood that the coming computer revolution was about more than better technology. It was about finding ways to help people share ideas and experiences with each other at a distance. Now that demo in turn inspired the groundbreaking work in places like Xerox PARC, Bell Labs, Stanford Research Institute, and others who made it possible for you to watch me on your computer today. Now these institutions were the inspiration for our recent name change to Facebook Reality Labs. Like computers, I believe augmented reality will be useful, but I also believe our work on it is what will make it transcend the distance between people. Especially now, during this time of social distancing, I know how much it means to me to be able to spend time in digital spaces with my parents and kids when we can't be in the same room. Millions of people across the world know what that's like too. And that's why, over the past year, our conviction about the importance of meaningful social presence has only grown, and why we remain committed to a world where emotional connection is no longer contingent on physical proximity, where interaction at a distance is just as enriching and sometimes just as demanding as interaction in person. Now, VR is the first half of that vision. And as all of you know, we've come a long way. I mean, I remember my first demo. It was, a, it was Toy Box. You know, you, you pick up a virtual dart gum and you could blast targets that were off floating in space. And it was very simple, but the potential struck me immediately. These days, VR is practically transcendent. I mean, I've climbed mountains, I've, I've battled robots in zero gravity, uh, I've explored alien planets. And I've done all these amazing things, but more often than not, I was doing them by myself. We have to continue to grow the VR community so that we can do more with our friends. So to bring in more people from more backgrounds, with Quest 2, we just built a better headset all around. I mean, it's lighter, it's faster, and it's got our highest resolution display ever. But all of that is small comfort if it doesn't fit right. That's why I'm pleased to announce some accessories we're launching for Quest 2. A fit pack, an elite strap, and the highly requested battery strap. Now, of course, it doesn't even matter how well it fits if it's not affordable, which is why I'm so, so proud that we got the price of Quest 2 down to $299. That's a full $100 less than Quest. That is a big deal. And if you're wondering what to do with that extra $100, be sure to stick around to hear about the great content our developers are bringing to the platform. Now, as I said at OC6, we're also building out our capacity for meaningful social presence in workspaces. We all know this has been a hard year for jobs and businesses. I mean, for those of us who have the privilege of working from home, we may have lost the commute, but we've also lost some of the community. For my org, for a lot of Facebook, and for people all over the world, Portal has been a real hero these past few months. And as of this month, in addition to Workplace, you'll be able to take meetings on Portal via BlueJeans, GoToMeeting, WebEx, and Zoom. With Portal as a dedicated screen for video calls, it's a lot easier to be present with your coworkers, and it frees up your laptop as well. But still, Portal is only the beginning of virtual presence in the remote workplace. I've been really impressed this year by the new collaboration and productivity apps in Quest built by third-party pioneers. And this is an area that we're investing a lot in as well. Now, longer term, we envision an enterprise ecosystem with expanding platforms and new business models made possible across distances. Maria's gonna tell you more about that later in the program. Now, the second half of our vision for the future of computing is augmented reality, or AR. We've made a lot of progress in the lab over the last year, and I'm excited to share it with you. At its essence, AR is a way of placing a digital, interactive layer on top of the real world. Already, a good smartphone can apply AR effects to things that it recognizes, like objects or pictures, bodies and faces. Three years ago, we created the Spark AR platform to help people do just that. And to date, more than 400,000 creators from 190 different countries have published effects for Facebook and Instagram, the majority of whom, 55%, are women. Now together, they've published over 1.2 million AR effects that are used by hundreds of millions of people every month across our apps and devices. In just the last three months, more than 150 effect owners have hit over a billion views and uses. It's pretty incredible. And I'm excited to announce that Beginning next year, we're opening Portal and Messenger for creator publishing as well. AR effects in chat are a really fun way to connect, especially for families. Now, the behaviors that we see validated today are gonna help us build a better AR tomorrow. 
And the promise of AR is the promise of an information-rich world where your capacity for knowledge, reason, and awareness is expanded well beyond your physical capacity to see, know, or recall. Now, in some ways, we already live in that world. I mean, we can do a lot with a smartphone and a good internet connection. And yet, <laughs> and yet there's just so much more we could be doing. Our digital experiences are still mediated by heads down, eyes down, handheld devices. At Facebook Reality Labs, we ask ourselves, what if that was no longer the case? What could the future hold that's even better than this? Imagine a pair of glasses that could give you a 3D overlay of everything without having to look down at anything. This is a world where you accept a friend's phone call and a hologram appears right in your line of sight, where you're walking into a new city and the glasses not only give you directions, but they also help you spot hazards that you can't see. You wanna understand a foreign language? The world translates itself for you. Now, sometimes we talk about the benefits of AR like they're superpowers, and they are, but not everyone has the same abilities. So for a lot of people, maybe for most people, it's going to be simply empowering. Now, before you get your hopes up, I am not here to announce V1 of our fully functional AR glasses. I'm sorry to say we're just not there yet, but I do have the privilege of sharing with you some of the work we've been doing in the lab. As Mark alluded to earlier, this is Project Aria. Now these glasses are a precursor to working AR. It doesn't display any information inside the lens, it's not for sale, and it's not a prototype. It's a research device that will help us understand how to build the software and hardware necessary for real, working AR glasses. Starting in September, some specially trained Facebook employees and contractors will be wearing the glasses in real-world conditions, indoors and outdoors. Their sensor platform will capture video and audio, eye tracking and location data, all to help us answer some of the questions that we need to ask before we release AR glasses to the general public. The first question is about hardware. <laughs> what do we put on the glasses? I mean, think of all the things necessary for AR to work. Outward sensors that can interpret the world, inward sensors that can track your eye movements and know where to show you information, and computers to process just all of that. And then, assuming you could fit everything you need into a pair of glasses, how would they perform under different light conditions or different weather conditions? Which sensors can you do without? And where might you need more? These are questions we can't answer in the lab. So like all good science, we have to put our theories to the test. Another question we have is about data. I mean, there's a lot of data sets about the world from the point of view of satellites or, or even automobiles, but there aren't a lot of what's called egocentric data sets. How do we program software that understands what the world looks like from a first person point of view? And more to the point, how do we balance what data we need to collect and process in the first place? At OC6, I introduced live maps, our effort at creating a shared virtual maps that are drawn from crowdsourced information, basically a 3D spatial internet. If we can design glasses that can both build and use live maps, we can deliver an AR experience that requires as little data as possible. Michael Abrash will share more later about the technical aspects being worked on in the lab, but before moving on, I'd like to show you guys a video we produced with the research team that introduces Project Aria. Aria is a comprehensive sensor platform that you wear like a pair of glasses and is used for research purposes. At the beginning of Aria, we actually evaluated many form factors. The hat, the bracelet, but we settled on the glasses because it could give us the closest human perspective. If you really want a system that is socially aware in a sense, it perceives the space like people do, you've got to look at the world from a human point of view. This allows us to start to teach devices to see, hear, and contextualize and making sense of the situation so that they could better help humans in the future. Imagine you lose your keys, and now you have a device that's able to tell you, hey, you left your keys on the coffee table. Or the ability to take your human senses and feel as if you are somewhere else in the world. When we think about navigation, it's not just the turn-by-turn -turn direction that you're getting from your phone, but it's really navigate you to anything. Navigation also will unlock amazing possibilities in public safety and accessibility. 
Project Aria is about figuring out the right privacy and safety and policy model long before we bring AR glasses to the world. We anonymize all the data, which means we blur faces and license plates. Starting in September, a few hundred Facebook workers will be wearing ARIA on campuses and in public spaces to help us collect data to uncover the underlying technical and ethical questions and start to look at answers to those. Where do we go from here? Well, we learn. The project is really going to be a series of iterations, right? It's going to develop over time, a bit like, you know, the internet. We're incredibly excited about the opportunity that Project Aria and the future of augmented reality brings. We're going to do this together, and it's going to be amazing. Now, as the video mentioned, in addition to the technical complexities we're navigating with Project Aria, we've also been working to answer some questions about how and when the glasses should be used. New technology often has unintended consequences and negative externalities, and our job is to get ahead of ours. AR glasses will be cool, but they shouldn't be rose-tinted. In order to wear the research glasses, people will undergo training on when and where they can gather data. Sensitive places like restrooms or prayer rooms are obviously off-limits. Before data we collect in public is used for research, the data is quarantined and faces and license plates are blurred. Like a mapping car, all participants will be easily identifiable by their clothing. You can find more details about Project Aria online, and we'll continue to use the lessons we gather to inform how we build and launch AR in the future. More generally though, all of this is about operationalizing a set of principles for responsible innovation that guide our work in the lab. At Facebook, principles are not just a list of nice things. They describe trade-offs, things that we do even when the opposite might benefit us somehow. So, for example, when we're building, we should be transparent about how and when data is collected and used over time so that people are not surprised. We will build simple controls that are easy to understand and clear about the implications of a choice. And we build for all people of all backgrounds, including people who aren't using our products at all, but may be affected by them. We think about this a lot in the context of Project Aria. And we strive to do what's right for our community, individuals, and our business, but when faced with these trade-offs, we prioritize our community. Moreover, because we recognize the limits to our own understanding, we're working with third-party experts to expand our sphere of input. As part of these efforts, I'm happy to announce two RFPs for over a million dollars around the principle, Consider Everyone. This research will focus on the impact of AR, VR, and smart device technology on non-users, especially non-users from underrepresented and vulnerable communities, as well as best practices for fostering welcoming and inclusive environments in 3D spaces. You can find out more here. We've also been socializing these principles with experts across the privacy, safety, and AR VR community. And they've told us they're happy we wrote them. But talk is cheap. Trust is earned and not given. And we stand ready to be judged by what we do and not what we say. I want to give a special shout out to the tireless teams at FRL, delivering meaningful social presence across a lot of different products under very challenging conditions. The future of technology is bright, and I'm so proud to work with all of you. I mean, I've been I excited want to shout about to Nick this who just Thank you, for Nick. a long time. <laughs> just like the labs that inspire us, we hope that our lab can play a role in helping shape the future. The need for this technology is all around us in 2020. Sheltering in place has only intensified my sense of urgency for this work. Every day away from my loved ones grows my conviction that this technology is important. But as excited as I am to introduce this to the world, I'm even more excited to use it myself. I mean, I miss seeing my family, my friends, my colleagues, and all of you. Be safe, and we hope to see you next year, one way or another. One way or another. We're going to see you next year, one way or another. Other, in other words, even if you don't buy a product, we will be seeing you. Right now. Someone's working in the lab, and someone's going far away from someone that they love. But someone's working in the lab. So someone who is far away can be with who they love each day. Right now, some genius who's eight years old is dreaming of a degree in a distant place beyond the sea. But someone's working in the lab. So the genius who was eight years old can study from where they choose to live and be. Right now, 
there's someone wishing for some superpowers to run and play with super speed, finally freed. That someone wishing for some superpowers will one day live to be a super someone. Because someone's working in the lab. We need each other in this world. We need not few of us, but all. That's why there's someone working in the lab right now. Right now, connecting with friends in VR is more important than ever. We want you to be able to spend time with your friends, your family, and your community in a way that defies distance and the physical constraints of the real world with virtual experiences. I'm Megan Fitzgerald, and this time last year, I shared our plans for Facebook Horizon, a social experience where you play, create, explore, and connect with others in an ever-expanding virtual world. Since then, we've been working hard to bring Horizon to everyone. A small group of early users and creators have been giving us feedback, and they're already building fantastic and incredibly creative worlds. And just last month, we opened the invite-only beta and began bringing people off the waitlist to join us in Horizon. And we're excited for more of you to join us soon and experience some of this. Has anyone here actually tried this? I didn't get invited into the beta, so I missed it. But if anyone out there has tried this, let me know in the chat what you think of it. Or not. Now let's talk about venues, a social experience where people can come together from all over the world to enjoy events together. This year, people have attended concerts, NBA games, and stand-up performances. And now, we're working on an improved version of venues. In fact, some of you may be watching today's keynote from the beta version already. There's a new lobby where you can socialize before, during, and after the show, because we know one of the best parts of an event is chatting about the experience with others who were there. And we also have new content coming, including a brand partnership with Tidal. Beyond Horizon and venues, we want to make the experience across all of Oculus more social, so you can discover people to play with, experience new worlds together, and build communities as you explore. We've heard that people want easier ways to find each other in VR, to coordinate and jump into apps and experiences together. And of course, ways to easily find each other in those apps. So we're rolling out some new features in the coming months that'll make it even easier to play together. First, we're bringing Messenger to the Quest platform. With Messenger and Oculus, it's easier to coordinate with friends and play together in VR. When you're in VR, you can invite friends to join you through Messenger, and they can quickly jump into the same game or experience with you. And this also means you can chat with friends anywhere they have Messenger without taking off the headset. We're introducing new Oculus avatars so people can express their identity and their personality with billions of permutations of customizations. Your avatar will be uniquely you. We're rolling out a new avatar SDK, so developers can also use this new avatar system, which will eventually replace the Oculus avatars we have today. These avatars will build on the visual style you see in Horizon and Venues Beta today. They're an early version of our new system. Here's a glimpse of what they'll look like. Oh, hey, it's me. 
We also want to make sure your avatar can represent you across all realities. So over time, we'll be working to let you use your avatar across the Facebook family of apps. And then I want to introduce a new experience called Challenges. It's all about you, the VR community, showing off your skills in your favorite games. Challenges allow you to create mini tournaments and challenge friends, your community, or the whole world. Whether it's a week-long competition to see who can achieve a global high score on that new Beat Saber song, or a daily motivator to get you and your friends to play synth riders. Now, groups of friends can play together and challenge each other, even when they're not in VR at the same time. And developers can create their own featured challenges, starting with Beat Saber, Pistol Whip, and Synth Riders. They'll have new challenges available weekly, so you can compete to be the best of the best. Challenges roll out on Quest today and will become available on Quest 2 when it launches later this year. And now, Chris Barber. like trailer moments leading into the next thing. Hi, my name's Chris Barber, and I work with the team that builds Spark AR. Our team, together with our global creator community, is starting to transform the Facebook experiences you already use. These AR effects can be everything from helpful to entertaining. And by blending the digital with the real world, we can connect you to and allow you to communicate with people, places, and things in an entirely new way. Take shopping. With Instagram, we see the potential to bring the best of in-store shopping anywhere. Virtual Try-On has been around a few years and is one of the earliest examples of how AR can help you to make informed choices while shopping online. AR Tryon has been live in Facebook ads and with a small group of Instagram checkout partners since last year. And we're excited to bring AR Tryon to Facebook shops soon. So what we've learned is that people feel more confident buying products like makeup or a lamp if they know how it'll look on them or in their home. Layer that with the ability to share with friends for a second opinion and buy without leaving the app, and you'll start to see how this becomes not just a way to shop, but one that's fun, easy, and personal. And it's not just the store that you can bring home with AR. It can be a museum too. Museums and cultural institutions around the world are capturing art, history, culture, and science collections in full 3D. It's about preserving history, but also about inviting more people to explore and appreciate culture no matter where they are. Paired with Spark AR, these objects become accessible to people in new ways, even if they can't visit in person. We're working with the Smithsonian to bring mobile AR experiences into the palm of your hands that spark curiosity and learning. From a triceratops on your kitchen counter to a pair of boots from the Wiz dancing around your living room. In addition to the Smithsonian, other experiences, including ones from the Palace of Versailles, will begin rolling out this fall. We also want to explore how this storytelling magic can extend to journalism. To lead the charge, the New York Times has formed a new AR lab within their newsroom. They hope to delight and inform readers by using AR technology to shape how stories are told. By delivering these stories where people already spend time, on Instagram, the Times can reach new audiences and help people better explore complex topics in an interactive way. One of the first stories, seen here, focuses on air pollution, allowing you to see particulate levels from around the world in your own space. There are many more AR stories launching across print and digital in the coming months. Each of these examples show you how AR on your phone can be a window to a new world. But what if we want to transport you to a new world? Well, AR can do that too. Earlier, Boz mentioned how Spark is powering new virtual shared spaces. AR is one of Portal's most popular calling features, and it helps make small moments more memorable, like these fun birthday cards. Families can share in the joy of reading with story time. 
rather than turn pages, AR brings the illustrations to life and actually lets the reader become characters in the story. Every day, parents tell us this makes a world of difference. While kids may not sit still for a phone call, story time can help families carve out a few special minutes with that relative who lives far away. We're working hard to expand the story time library. It's important that this collection reflect and celebrate all the stories of our portal families. The first in this new lineup will be Thank You Amu, the Caldecott honored debut from Oge Mora. Colorful cut paper designs capture a heartwarming story of sharing and community, inspired by the female role models in her life. Thank You Amu is launching on Portal next month. We're also excited to bring Kevin Carroll's A Kid's Book About Belonging to Portal. Its core message is about helping kids love themselves, even if it feels like they don't fit in. It teaches them how this love can help them belong anywhere. We'll have more to share on these titles and others in the coming months. I hope this gave you just a taste of what's possible in AR. If you're feeling inspired, join us. Check out our Spark Creator session this afternoon and learn how you too can bring this AR-powered world to life. Now, to tell you more about the fully immersive VR worlds dreamed up by Oculus developers, please welcome Mike Verdu. I'm Mike Verdu, VP of Content. We are excited, encouraged, even stunned by the progress that VR has made in just 12 short months. So many wonderful Quest titles have launched in the last year, creating a catalog of rich, vibrant experiences. Our ecosystem growth is accelerating, and more and more developers are seeing success. But all of these positive developments are impossible to separate from the physical and emotional effects of the pandemic. This is an uncertain and difficult time. But creativity and art, well, they shine their brightest in uncertain times. And our new medium is bringing us together, even as many of us are far apart. We hope our technology is helping you to feel more connected. Whether you're hopping into VR with a friend to hang out, play a game together, get some work done, or exploring experiences like in protests, which lets you become better acquainted with the unsung heroes preserving and extending our constitutional rights in the name of black lives and racial justice. Our developers are finding new ways to stay connected as well, showing us the future of work as they defy physical distance to create amazing products. We salute these teams as they redefine the work ethic and compassion of this industry, adapting their processes in a new paradigm to launch titles that span every corner of the globe. So, Five months ago, we shared that 10 developers had made over $2 million in revenue from Quest content alone. Today, I'm happy to share that over 35 titles on Quest have generated revenue in the millions since launch, and they're doing it faster than ever before. This summer, Onward's Quest debut made a million dollars in revenue in just four days, faster than any other title on the platform and Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted reached a million dollars in just eight days. These are powerful milestones that show how more and more teams are able to pursue continued VR development and see a return on investment. And as a result, there is an acceleration in creativity in all categories, from games to productivity, collaboration, fitness, education, and others. The coming year will be an exciting one. We have some major announcements as we continue growing our slate with the launch of Quest 2. So let's dive into this exciting new content. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Laverso, Vice President of Product Development at Ubisoft's Red Storm Entertainment. Ubisoft is pioneers in new technology. We're early investors in new consoles and tech, and we've been creating VR experiences since 2016. With titles like Eagle Flight, Werewolves Within, and Star Trek Bridge Crew, which are all available on the Oculus platform. 
And today, we are excited to announce our first AAA franchises for the VR market, which are Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell. For the first time ever, fans will be able to live these beloved franchises in a truly visceral way. Development of Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell will be led by Ubisoft Redstorm in collaboration with Ubisoft Reflections, Ubisoft Dusseldorf, and Ubisoft Mumbai. Both titles will be created from the ground up exclusively for the Oculus platform and will include elements of both the Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell franchises that players know and love. We are excited to share more about these projects with you. Stay tuned. Thanks for kicking us off with that awesome news. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth Bram, and I've been a producer at Oculus for over six years, helping our developers make games and entertainment experiences for our platform. So let's talk about Quest. In addition to exploring the Quest content library with Quest 2, you'll be able to dive into original experiences with even greater scope and superior quality, thanks to the advanced capabilities of this new hardware. So I've asked a few of our developers making awesome games with Quest 2 to join us today and share their exciting news. Hi everyone, I'm Jose Perez III, director of Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. At ILMX Lab, we've been hard at work crafting tales and expanding the world of Black Spire Outpost, which was created by our friends at Walt Disney Imagineering. After the award-winning success of Vader Immortal, we wanted to follow up with something lighthearted and a little more open, a project that will expand over time. So we'd like to invite you to explore the wilds of Batu. Danger lurks around every corner, but it's nothing you can't handle with the help of specialized training droids and a good blaster at your side. Or you could always just hang out in the cantina. The bartender, Cecil Slack, might not make the best drinks, but he can tell a story that will literally transport you to a different time and place in the Star Wars galaxy. One of these tales will put you face to face with an iconic and powerful Jedi, Master Yoda. Before we go, let's take a sneak peek at one of the characters you'll join forces with along the way. Someone, anyone, please help! My counterpart, R2-D2, and I were on board a part supply vessel bound for Batuu, but it was attacked. You needn't worry. I am a highly trained resistant spy. Oh dear. You'll do what? Oh, don't be silly. You'll never make it. My circuits have had quite enough of the wilds for one day. Hi, I'm Cha Chin, founder and CEO of Big Box VR. We've been working very hard on Population One a battle royale that is only possible in VR. I'm excited to share with you that it's coming soon to the Quest and Rift platforms, and you'll be able to cross play between headsets. What makes our game special is our vertical combat system. You have the freedom to climb anything and fly anywhere in a fully immersive VR world. After launch, we will have ongoing live and game events, so you will always have something fun to do with your friends. I can't wait for you to jump into Population One with us, and I'll see you in the game. I'm Jan, head of the development at Beat Games. First, thank you to our passionate Beat Saber community. We could not have announced this incredible news without your continued support. For a while now, 
we've been exploring ways to play Beat Saber with a friend or with many friends. I'm excited to share that Beat Saber multiplayer will be launching on October 13th. This is the biggest update to the game since we launched. I can't wait for you to try it. And we have one more thing from Depp. Thanks, Jan. As you all know, music is core to Beat Saber. Thinking of who we could celebrate the launch of Quest 2 with, one artist came to mind immediately. Their music spreads positivity, transcends languages and borders, and has touched many lives, including mine. I am so excited to announce that our next music pack will be in partnership with BTS, featuring their recently launched characters, Tiny Tan. Tiny Tan have fun and distinct personalities inspired by the personas of BTS members. Through the magic door, they cross over from their universe to ours, transcending reality and imagination. I'm eager for you to meet them in the world of Beat Saber this November, and for you to play with other fans in multiplayer mode. Hello, I'm Apoorva Gandhi, brand manager at Crytek. It's hard to believe that the climb launched five years ago before Rift even supported the touch controllers. Now, more than ever, it's crucial to expand our horizon, explore the virtual world, and connect with others. With a new city setting, 15 new maps, events, leaderboards, and more. We've been overwhelmed by the sustained community support received on the Climb franchise, and we can't wait to share the Climb 2 with you soon. Hi, I'm Brian Gomez, executive producer on the Universal Games and Digital Platforms team. Here at Universal, storytelling's at the heart of everything we do, and we're always looking for new and innovative ways for our fans to experience the worlds we create. We're excited to do exactly that, in partnership with Oculus and CoatSync, by bringing you Jurassic World Aftermath. It's a thrilling survival adventure built from the ground up for VR. Experiencing Jurassic World in VR is a special kind of wish fulfillment. Set two years after the fall of Jurassic World, Jurassic World Aftermath lets you race through Isla Nublar, retrieving valuable information while being stalked by deadly velociraptors at every turn. You're gonna need to think quick, solve puzzles, and use all of your survival skills to get out alive. So here it is, your first look at Jurassic World Aftermath. I'm so thankful for the relationship we've built with some of the developers behind these games, like Jurassic World Aftermath and Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge, to ensure they're comfortable and engaging and an incredibly fun experience for you. And I wanna share my enthusiasm for all of these new titles because it doesn't stop here for the Quest platform. We're gonna be rolling out even more high quality and cutting edge content 
So let's take a look at some of the other titles coming to Quest. The Adeptosauroritas are brought to life in jaw-dropping visceral reality. Embody these merciless women as they root out corruption in the war-torn world of Warhammer 40k Battle Sister. This holiday season, Pistol Whip will debut 2089, a gritty and cinematic sci-fi expansion where you'll survive an off-world plague of killer machines with all new weapons and music. In over 25 years since its creation, Myst is being reimagined for VR. Solve puzzles and travel through the ages in this graphic adventure classic. Then get ready to fight the undead and face gut-wrenching choices for you and other survivors in The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners. And coming soon, keep to the shadows and take aim in Sniper Elite VR. Japan is home to a community of early Oculus adopters and has a strong history of game development. As we prepare for the launch of Quest 2, we've been fortunate to partner with well-known Japanese developers and have committed significant and long-term marketing and development budgets to Japanese developed titles. So we're bringing Oculus to Japan in a bigger way than ever before, with Quest 2 available in more stores and with more content. At launch, you'll see games like Kizuna Eye, Touch the Beat from Activate, Res Infinite from Enhance, Space Channel 5 VR Kind of Funky Newsflash from Grounding, and Little Witch Academia VR from Universe. And later on, we're also looking forward to bringing our Japanese audience titles like Alt Deus Beyond Kronos from My Dearest, Puzzle Bobble from Servios and Taito Corporation, and many more. Now you're probably asking, what about PC? We know that PC gamers are looking for a best-in-class experience, and that's why they've embraced Rift as the gold standard for high-fidelity gaming. But now we've got something that offers you an even better experience than Rift. Quest 2 Plus Link gives you a higher resolution at a lower cost and future support for higher frame rates up to 90 hertz. It's the best way across the VR industry to play PC VR content. So if you have a VR-ready PC, you can use your Quest 2 Plus Link to play upcoming Rift titles from our talented indie developers and also upcoming titles like Lone Echo 2 and Medal of Honor Above and Beyond. Hello there. I am Peter Hirschman, the game director of Medal of Honor Above and Beyond. I am terrible at making videos like this, so please bear with me. However, I would like to tell you it's been a phenomenal few years working with our good friends at Oculus to bring you a brand new Medal of Honor title. In Medal of Honor Above and Beyond, we're putting you in the boots of a World War II soldier so we can tell the stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things in the face of overwhelming odds. I'm happy to announce that Medal of Honor is shipping December 11th on Rift. It's playable on Quest with a link cable. And I'm very excited to announce it's shipping at the same time on Steam with full Steam VR support and crossplay. We're really looking forward to seeing you in the game. Please take care of yourself and wash your hands. So as you can see, we're committed to the Oculus platform as the paragon of VR content. And that's why we're partnering with some of the most talented game studios in the industry to craft powerful and memorable experiences. Whether it's stepping inside the worlds that you know and love, exploring new ones, or even making connections with friends and family in spite of distance. And I bet you the titles we're launching in the years to come will be some of the best games in VR that you have ever played. Now, here's Maria to discuss the future of work. Last year at Oculus Connect, I shared a vision for our VR-enabled future of work, where we could work from anywhere. I said it will take years, probably, before we could make the vision a reality. But then, nearly overnight, around the world, everything changed. 
And suddenly, we were forced to learn what it means to work remotely. And we experienced the joys, like being able to have lunch with your family every day, and the challenges, like building new relationships online, collaborating on complex problems, and sometimes feeling lonely. We are relying on a mixed bag of ways to connect. Email, video, chat, they all work, okay. But VR has the potential to get us closer to what we know we can achieve in person and a lot more. Our vision remains the same, but we have accelerated our efforts to get there. Whether you're on your own, running a small business, or at a Fortune 500, we think VR can help you work better. We are learning every day from the creative ways people are using VR. Scientists, for example, are doing collaborative drug discovery from home. We definitely need that right now. And every day, more companies ask whether VR could be good for them too. That's where Oculus for Business comes in. It already offers professional features like fleet management or enterprise-grade support. It's built on Workplace, our solution trusted by companies of all sizes, from SMBs to the world's biggest companies. We offer business-friendly ways to log in to the headset, like Workplace accounts or no account at all. We are rolling out resources to help companies get started and for developers to meet this growing demand. This includes a new vendor directory and business channels designed specifically for app distribution directly to administrators. Quest 2 is going to be great for all types of work. It is lightweight and ergonomic, so it's more comfortable for longer work sessions. New accessories like our Elite Strap with battery are designed to increase comfort and extend battery life. Compared to Quest, Quest 2 is packed with better processing power, so you can run heavier apps more smoothly. There's also a higher resolution display, so you can read text in docs and presentations more easily. On their own, these features are exciting, but combined, we will push standalone VR to new limits. We believe VR will be your next computer, a better way to surf the web, play games, chat with friends, and collaborate with your colleagues across distance. But before we can connect you to others, we need to help you on your own get things done. I'm so excited to introduce Infinite Office. Now, when I say Infinite Office, I am not talking about that feeling when you have been like working from home for 14 hours straight, although that might feel infinite. This is something else. Check it out. Infinite Office is a collection of features we will be rolling out over the coming months. What you saw in the video illustrates the experience as we envision it. These are new capabilities we are designing to make your office, whatever it is, feel more productive and flexible. Let's talk about some of the features you will see first. Thinking about your workspace, we begin with this big area with multiple customizable screens, all without expensive monitors eating up space. And across them, Oculus Browser provides you with a desktop class web experience. The next cool thing is that the experience integrates with your real environment. You can attach those panels to multiple surfaces, like a table or a couch or a desk. It's easily portable and persistent, so you can pick things up right where you left off. Now you are truly free to take your office with badass monitors wherever you go. And you may be thinking, Maria, that's all great, but how can I work in VR if I can't even type in there? We all know one of the biggest barriers has been text input. So we took care of that too. In partnership with Logitech, we are bringing a physical keyboard into VR. You will be able to actually see your keyboard and your hands finally type, and yes, even copy paste. My team and lots of others at Facebook are already trying out this infinite office. Initial features begin rolling out to Quest 2, 
first in experimental release this winter, so you can join us. We are starting with solo productivity, but there's a lot more we can do with these capabilities. We always want to power use cases that connect people and promote collaboration, and we have more in store. But I can't talk about that quite yet. There's one last thing I want to mention. We are committed to putting these technologies in the hands of developers too. And we have already started. Check out this prototype we did with Spatial that layers pass through with their collaboration app. That's just a glimpse, and we'll have more to share next year. It is amazing to see how far we've come since launching Quest only last year. But if you want to know where we're headed, and who doesn't, Michael Abrash is just the person to show you. Good morning. I so wish I could be talking to you in person, but I'm still very much looking forward to sharing some of the AR technology we're developing at FRL Research. First, though, a quick update. Last year, I mentioned that my grandson had just been born. Now he's almost a year old, and he has changed a bit. In fact, he's grown so much and changed so rapidly that it's made me reflect on how remarkable the course of a lifetime really is. And thinking back on my own life, I realized that the things that have really mattered, both personally and professionally, have been the ones that I planted as tiny seeds and that then grew over the years and touched ever more people's lives. In the long run, there is truly no more satisfying feeling and I'm deeply confident that we'll all have that feeling when we look back on AR VR years from now. Because, as I've discussed at Past Connects, AR VR is the second great wave of human oriented computing, combining real and virtual to explore the limits of human experience and change the way we live. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the technologies we're developing to enable the first generation of true AR glasses glasses that let us mix real and virtual freely and that are good enough to become part of everyday life. Now, be aware that this is research. Those technologies may take up to 10 years to make their way into products, if they ever make it there at all. That seems like a long time, but it's just the beginning. What's coming over the long arc of AR VR will be far more than any of us can imagine today. Just as the personal computer developers of 40 years ago, myself included, could not have imagined the long arc of personal computing that's created the digital world we live in today. For all the ways personal computing has evolved over the last half century, though, one thing has remained constant over all that time, and that is the basic way humans interact with the digital world in the form of the GUI, the graphical user interface, which has been the gold standard of human-computer interaction since Doug Engelbart's mother of all demos in 1968. Information is presented to us on a 2D surface. We navigate it and select it with pointing, dragging, and clicking, and new information is presented. That has been phenomenally successful. But AR glasses need their own Engelbart moment, a new user interface that is fundamentally different from the GUI. A paradigm shift is needed because always-on AR glasses have the potential to be integral to almost everything we do. They will always be available to help us communicate, navigate, learn, share, and act. So the user interface has to work seamlessly no matter what we're doing. What's more, AR glasses will be able to see our lives as we see them. So for the first time, it will be possible for AI to be truly personalized and contextualized. That, in turn, opens the door to an interface that's proactive rather than reactive, that's intuitive, that understands our intent and acts almost before we know we need it. Ideally, that interface would have very little friction, would be highly reliable and private, and would allow us to remain completely present in the real world at all times. Most of all, the ideal AR interface would, for the first time, put us at the center of our personal technology, rather than adapting and reacting to our devices as we do today. Those are very ambitious goals, and it will take decades to fully realize them. But by planting the seeds now, we can get to AR's Engelbart moment, and then get that interface into people's hands over the next 10 years. There are many pieces that have to come together to enable the AR interface, including a breakthrough display system, a novel graphics pipeline, and new types of sensors, and we're working on all of them. But today, I'm going to focus on three areas that are at the heart of redefining the way we interact with the digital world. Input and output, mapping the real world, and the interface itself. 
Input, how we send information to our devices, and output, how our devices send information to us, form the foundation for all human-computer interaction. AR input and output are uniquely challenging because they need to work easily and intuitively in all the situations we encounter in our daily lives. Let's look at two research areas that have the potential to revolutionize the AR interface. The first is electromyography, or EMG, a novel input approach that can read the signals on the motor neurons that run through the wrist to the hand. EMG is still in the research phase, but the Control Labs team that joined us last year is advancing the state of the art rapidly, as we can see in this video. This part's just gonna be silent for us all to watch, I guess. That does look really cool. In a sense, this is a brain-computer interface, but it's an interface that operates where the brain signals are stronger, easier to read, and less ambiguous than on the head. In fact, the signals through the wrist are so clear that EMG can detect finger motion of just a millimeter, so input can be very discreet. And ultimately, it may even be possible to sense just the intent to move a finger. An EMG can be made highly reliable, like a mouse click or a key press. Finally, it can be very intuitive, since it can utilize actions you already do with your hands. Initially, EMG will provide just one or two bits of what I'll call neural click, the equivalent of tapping on a button or pressing and then releasing it, but it will quickly progress to richer controls. Here are a few early samples of how it could be used in AR. It's so weird how they're showing these with like no talking and it's just totally silent. It's like, look at this demonstration. Nothing's happening. There should be someone here being like, now watch him play chess and pick up this piece and move it just in front of the pawns for no apparent reason. And no one else is there taking a turn because you're playing alone. Oh, but you can also play Jenga all by yourself like you've always wanted to. <laughs> I will say, I just recently played a finger tracked experience. Pretty cool. It was pretty good. But that's just the beginning. It's highly likely that ultimately we will be able to type at high speed with EMG, maybe even at higher speed than it is possible with a keyboard today. Initial research is promising, as we can see in this video. Okay, that's that's a big promise to say that using these to type might actually be faster because there's nothing there's nothing to feel you're not getting that tactile feel of an actual keyboard so it's hard to imagine this would actually that it's hard to imagine that this could work so that well. far i've only shown scenarios that map to normal use of the hands but there's plenty of bandwidth through the wrist to support novel controls imagine you put on an emg bracelet and a quest and look at your hand and you have a sixth finger you start to flex your hand and quickly gain independent control of that new finger then you take off the quest, but you can still use that finger to click. Totally discreet and highly intuitive. Pretty much the ideal one-bit input. Is the brain that neuroplastic? We don't know yet, but this next video makes me optimistic. Yeah, word prediction. So it's it's like a phone. They're going to probably use like autocorrect and stuff, which still, I mean, that could be even more annoying. I don't know. That person was born with the limited hand functionality you saw, but it took him only five minutes to learn to control the virtual hand. There are years of research yet. That part is really But cool. EMG has the potential to be the core input device for AR glasses. The other novel input-output area is audio in the form of several research technologies that together have the potential to transform human communication. Let's start with beamforming, which leverages a microphone array to enhance sound from any desired direction. Beamforming makes it possible for AR glasses to extract your voice out of virtually any soundscape, so the person on the other end of a call can hear you even if you're in a crowded cafe speaking in a normal voice. Next. Let's add in-ear monitors, custom audio devices, like this research prototype, that fit in your ear and can selectively filter ambient sound. Now, when you get that call in a noisy cafe, the glasses can mute the ambient noise so you can comfortably hear the caller. Next up are personalized head-related transfer functions, or HRTFs, 
personalized digital representations of the acoustic characteristics of our ears and heads that enable us to hear virtual sounds with the same clear directionality as in the real world. Now we can place virtual callers in specific locations near you, so conversations become much more natural and easy to follow. The final technology is audio propagation, simulation of how sounds move around spaces, which enables us to generate the subtle echoes and reverberations needed to create a convincing soundscape. Put all those technologies together, and virtual conversations can be indistinguishable from real ones, even when you're in a noisy environment. What if you're trying to talk to someone who's actually there with you in that noisy cafe? Just turn on beamforming, point the glasses at the person you want to talk with, and the glasses will pick out that person's voice and mute the ambient noise. If they have AR glasses too, direct glasses-to-glasses -glasses transmission will enable you to have a natural, relaxed conversation. This is all research right now, but when it's product ready, AR glasses will give us audio superpowers. Let's walk through a scenario of how audio superpowers could enhance our lives. First, let's see how the scenario would work with today's technology. By the way, you'll get the best experience of this audio section if you listen with headphones or in Oculus venues. Okay, let's say you go to that noisy cafe and want to study. The noise makes it hard to concentrate. Then a friend comes in. You try to talk, but it's hard and tiring due to the noise. Oh, sorry, Sarah. I didn't mean to make you jump. I didn't see you come in. Parking took forever. I had to circle the block. Another friend comes in, and it's even harder, because now you're not always looking at the speaker when they start to talk, and seeing mouth movements is a big part of how you understand speech in noisy environments. Sorry, guys. Let me guess. Parking? Yes. I had to for the last spot. Finally, a friend video calls in. You all crowd around a phone and try to hear what they're saying on speaker, and they try to hear you over all the ambient noise. Perfect. Hang on, let me flip the camera. How awesome is this? They do these amazing balloon bouquets. They're beautiful. Mila would totally love that. Oh, did you find a birthday cake to jump out of? What? Not a very satisfying experience. Now, let's see what it's like with audio superpowers. You sit down to study in the cafe and turn on ambient muting. It's easy to focus. A friend comes in. They have to tap you on the shoulder to get your attention. Oh, sorry, Sarah. I didn't mean to make you jump. I didn't see you come in. But then you turn on beamforming, and they come through clear as a bell. And their voice sounds like it's coming from them, not from a speaker. Parking took forever. I had to circle the block. That's okay, I was working on the list. I see that. It's clearly labeled Millie's surprise party. Another friend joins you. You hear whoever you're looking at clearly. Although sometimes when the speaker changes, you miss a few words until you turn your head. Party after all. Sorry I'm late, guys. What did I miss? Wait, where's the guess? Parking? Mark is looking for a birthday cake to jump out. for the last spot. Wait, where's Mark? Finally, a friend calls in. You answer. Conference everyone's glasses in, and you all talk freely. That's him now. Hey, Mark. Leslie and Danny are here. Perfect. Hang on. Let me flip the camera. How awesome is this? They do these amazing balloon bouquets. They're beautiful. Thanks to your personalized HRTF, you can pick a specific location for your virtual friend's voice, just like your friends who are there in the flesh have a physical location. It's a lot like sitting around a table in your own dining room. Millie would totally love that. Oh, did you find a birthday cake to jump out of? The second scenario still isn't perfect, but it's vastly better. And later on, we'll see how to make it pretty much perfect. Let's shift gears now and look at machine perception, a very different but equally important aspect of building the AR interaction model of the future. This is similar to, but more far-reaching than computer vision, in that it involves your AR glasses not only sensing the state of the world around you, but also building a detailed, dynamic, persistent 3D map of the parts of the world that are relevant to you, and developing an understanding of everything that map contains. Let's look at what that means and what it implies. The foundation of AR is the ability to have persistent, shareable virtual entities of all sorts embedded in the real world, including such things as whiteboards, screens, CAD models, notes, pictures, rooms, outdoor settings, and avatars. The ability to have virtual entities is like a magic wand that lets you customize, annotate, and enhance your world, and share that with others however you wish. None of that can happen without a detailed 3D map of the parts of the world that are personally relevant to you, for several reasons. First, 
Virtual objects have to be world locked to be useful and convincing. That is, they have to remain steady with respect to the real world, just as real objects do. That requires accurate and robust tracking of where the head is with respect to the world. Now, head tracking alone doesn't require a detailed 3D map, just a current set of environment features to track. However, it gets trickier if you want world-locked persistent objects. How can they persist without some sort of database to store their locations? That becomes even more true when you want to share virtual objects with other people. That requires a common coordinate system, and again, there's no general solution other than indexing into a shared 3D map. And then, if you want to be able to share space with a convincing avatar of a friend who lives in another state, not only are precise location and orientation needed, but also knowledge of the things in the space around you, so the avatar doesn't end up cut in half by a table, and can be placed in natural poses, such as sitting in a chair. So both a selectively shareable model of the parts of the world that are relevant to you, and an index of everything in that model, are necessary in order for AR to mix virtual and real effectively. Finally, a 3D map of the world is necessary in order to allow AR glasses to run all day within a very tight power and thermal envelope. This is the least interesting part so far. The glasses had to constantly reassess their context from scratch. So instead, they'll download the most recent data from the map and then only have to handle dynamic changes, which are propagated back to the map. The end-to-end -end machine perception platform we're building that enables all of this is called Live Maps. Live Maps consists of a stack of three primary layers. The bottom layer, Location, provides an accurate frame of reference for the locations of the wearer and their surroundings. That might not sound like much, but establishing highly accurate, always available, consistent, shareable 3D location and orientation in a way that can scale is in fact a tremendous challenge. The index layer builds on location to create a detailed 3D map of all the physical surfaces, structures, and objects in the parts of the real world that are relevant to you. This is a unique personal map based on your own location history, although parts may be shared. To the extent that you and others choose to allow, for example, public places could be globally shared. Index does quite a bit more than just provide static geometry, though. It also identifies objects and provides metadata about them, such as appearance, mass, Modes of use, interaction. Okay, I'm going to turn this guy down for a bit because I'm seriously losing all attention in what he's going about. But I do want to say real quick to the people out there what, what are some of the stuff I'm most excited about. And let me know in the chat what you think. But I'm pretty excited about, obviously, Beat Saber multiplayer. Wrist being missed being reimagined for VR is super cool. Obviously, another Star Wars game with C3PO and then Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell, actually, I think is some of the most exciting news. So, tell me in chat what you think about that. But I definitely am not into what this guy's saying, but at least that other stuff has given us some good news. I'm hoping Quest News isn't over, but I'm worried. I'm worried they've just, they're like, oh, we leaked it all this week, so you don't need it anymore. A better name might be the personal ontology layer. Ontology is a bit of an esoteric word, but for our purposes, it means that the top layer stores the relationships, histories, and predictions for the entities and events that matter personally to each of us, whether they're anchored in the real world or not, along with the interconnections with a variety of global knowledge graphs. It might store a virtual vase you have on the dining room table, but it also might store non-geolocated information, such as the name of your favorite Thai restaurant, or the people who have RSVP'd for your party next week or the ETA for your flight to Atlanta. And it links those nodes to knowledge graphs that define the concepts of restaurant, party, and ETA. In short, it's the set of concepts and categories and their properties and the relations between them that model your life to whatever extent you desire, and it can, at any time, surface the information that's personally and contextually relevant to you. So the location layer says where things are, the index layer says what's known about physical things, and the content layer says why things, physical, virtual, and conceptual, matter to each of us personally. You will have your own set of layers based on your unique life experience, so live maps will effectively be a virtual model of your life up to that moment. And that is the foundation for the second key aspect of machine perception, a truly personalized and contextualized AI assistant. To date, assistants have been able to understand relatively little about your personal context and needs, but that changes with AR glasses. Now, by querying live maps, an assistant can observe your world from an egocentric view, the same way you see it from a first-person perspective, and that is the basis for true human-centered technology. Obviously, we're a long way from that now, 
In particular, we don't have the necessary egocentric training data. So the question is, how are we going to bootstrap this breakthrough AI assistant? Which brings us to Project ARIA. Project ARIA is a research effort built around the custom glasses you see here that is designed to record high quality egocentric data, which in turn will enable researchers to advance the state of the art around machine perception and personalized contextually aware AI. Project ARIA is not in itself an AR device since it lacks a display, and it is neither a product nor a prototype of a product and will not be for sale. It is a research tool, and it is a critical step on the path to live maps and the interface of the future. One way to think about Project ARIA is as an evolution of the methods which were used to build maps in the past. Since the 1960s, satellites have allowed us to map outdoor environments at tremendous scale, but they're limited in the map resolution. And okay, what is this guy going on about? I think at this point, we should probably just move to discussing some. I'll kind of keep him on in the background in case anything interesting comes up, and we'll we'll switch back over to it if it does. I'll leave it playing in the background, but I'm just... He's he's trying too hard to explain to us. I feel like the problem was they said, okay, we're going to make this thing, because I think the actual event goes for like eight hours. And they're like, we got to make this thing go for eight hours. So now they have this guy just going on and on about this stuff that, that might interest some developers but definitely for me i'm not not uh not into that so here's yeah here's these cool glasses you can't have they're basically explaining to us how these people that are going to have these glasses are going to use them and learn this and nothing else so yeah i'm not into this part if anyone else is let me know in chat if you want me to turn this back up but i'm just going to kind of keep it here in case something interesting happens and then we're going to switch over because yeah this dude is boring the crap out of me so uh Assassin's Creed came up earlier. That's that's super exciting because hopefully they're actually talking about home experiences. Cuz the last thing that the last thing that we heard about any Assassin's Creed VR was that it was only location based things. You had to go there. And during COVID, going there isn't isn't an option for most of us. Uh going anywhere. I mean, if you had one within 20 miles maybe, but otherwise no, not at all. So I I feel like they just barely gave us any information on the freaking quest like yeah they leaked it all this week and that was kind of what i was worried about about this presentation like i was thinking man they already gave us all this news how are they gonna do more show more tell us more during the event and basically the answer to that question was they're not <laughs> they just didn't do anything <laughs> yes walk around the house and assassinate people yes <laughs> Uh, you got you got flagged for the word assassinate. I had to approve your comment. Facebook HoloLens. Yeah, but for now, this is just doing research. This is just documenting our world before they even make glasses. Because they said these don't even have holograms in them yet. So, like, I feel like Facebook definitely on this front might be a little behind uh, if they don't get on this quicker. Also, I feel like if you look at those glasses with how much stuff is around them, it seems like they're going to really impede your vision. But that might be purposely. Because I don't know how many of you ever out there have gotten to try a HoloLens. But if you're used to VR, the HoloLens can actually be pretty underwhelming because you can fully see everything. You have your whole 220 degree natural human field of view, but the holograms could only appear on the original in about 50 degrees. So it was like this tiny little box where would have a hologram. And the minute you turn your head, the hologram would just disappear out of nowhere because it wasn't, it was only in this little box that it could show it. So having a smaller lens, if that has the hologram would show throughout the entire lens, it might be more immersive that way. Catnick, here's something you can't buy. They did give all the technical info for the quest, just lack of titles announced. Feels like a Facebook board meeting. Yeah, I mean, they've given us a few little titles. The the Jurassic Park one, the Star Wars one, uh, of course, I don't know. I don't, did they say Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell? We're going to be exclusive. I don't think so. I think they're just saying that that's coming to VR. Uh, a lot of people in Twitter are upset. It's only VR, in VR and it's only for Oculus. <laughs> that happens with every game we get. Remember Half-Life Alex? Remember how everybody went into an uproar? But we need more of that. I hate to say it, but like we need games that can only be played in VR that wouldn't be the same flat to get people to see how much different VR is. Because if they keep dropping these shooters that could be played flat and really aren't that much different, you just press reload instead of actually reloading, people aren't gonna people aren't gonna make the switch. We need games like Beat Saber that there's no way to play that flat or enjoy it flat. That is made to be a VR game. And hopefully some of these other games will do that because that's how we can keep getting people on the platform, trying it, and then seeing how good it is. Because everything I've seen... <laughs> thanks, Steak. Everything I've seen with the haters, I have not found a hater I couldn't convert yet. 
Like it, it takes the right experience, the right amount of time, but eventually I've been able to convert everyone uh, who didn't care for it. So that's what we need is we just need people to keep getting in it and seeing that, that this is such a different new medium. There's so much to it. Man, this guy is just going on and on. <laughs> I wish there was a fast forward, but it's live. I just want to see. I want to know if there's anything more with the with the quest announcements. Uh, apparently, people have said the reviews have all dropped. So what probably happened was they probably sent Quest 2s out a week ago to most of the big VR YouTubers and had them sign an NDA and said, basically, Sal, do you want to hear him? Because I turned him down because he's super boring. <laughs> I'll turn him up a little bit. I'm just, I just basically have him on in my ear. So if he starts talking about something that's interesting, I'll turn him back up. Uh, so they sent out the Quest 2s and made him sign an NDA probably saying, you cannot release this until one hour into Facebook Connect. So probably all these reviews have just dropped literally just now. So as soon as this is over, I'll definitely go check out, see, probably see if Mike over at VR Oasis, he's kind of, he's kind of one of my top go-tos. Him and the guys that tested, uh, Adam Savage just tested are the ones that I usually go to first for reviews because I feel like they give the best ones. Uh, I'm really frustrated about them doing the head strap thing and then also offering to get a better head strap for 30 bucks. It's like, you already made the quest only 300 bucks. Why don't you make it with a better head strap for $325 or something like, why, why hostage us into buying something that's going to come with an inferior strap and then having to replace the strap? Like, they could have done better there. That's That's disappointing to me. Do you have one yet, Jay? No, no, I do not, uh, Sal. I, I don't know what I what I can and can't say on the stream, but I, I was thinking I had to get one to review it and do that. But it sounds like sounds like potentially one of our most amazing supporters out there might be helping us get our hands on one, which would be absolutely incredible. Uh, but I won't be able to get it until the public date, which is of course the 13th of next month. So I won't be able to do an early review like any of these other people. I would get it when they came out and then I'll give you my thoughts and everything. So, uh, Adam Savage and Upload VR. Okay, both upload. There's the same time. Nice. Yeah, they probably had it like down to the minute on the NDA. It was probably like at this minute, Pacific time, you're allowed to upload. And so we'll probably see a bunch of them probably came out then and probably more will be coming out throughout the day. Maybe one day. Yes. It must be lost in the mail. Where's my invite? <laughs> I think the game announcements are shown on the Oculus site. Yeah. Contractors VR, we knew was coming. Saints and Sinners, we knew was coming. And Asgard's Wrath, that's an Oculus exclusive. So that's kind of a big deal that's coming to the Quest because like a lot of people haven't been able to play it at all because it's an Oculus exclusive. Andrew C. waiting on that publish button, just sitting there waiting to click it. <laughs> yeah, I am excited to check this one out. I just, the head strap thing is so annoying to me, especially if they drop the price. But also, one thing I kind of touched on this in the discussion earlier, uh, one thing that I wanted to say that's just kind of weird about the way they're handling this, they are they are breaking all the rules. They're doing this totally differently than like any gaming console or anything has ever done in the past. Like Typically, you wait till the end of life on a product, and during that entire time you're waiting till the end of life, so that the Quest 1 as it ages, they would keep dropping the price. So like now, right now, if you wanted to go buy a PS4, you could buy one used for sometimes as cheap as 100 bucks. Uh, I know they've gone up because of COVID, but in normal cases, you could buy a cheap used one or you're waiting for the PS5 to come and you're like, yes, this is exciting. The PS5 is expensive, but obviously the PS4 has come way down in price. So you don't feel that bad if you already own a PS4 and you're going to get a PS5. What they've effectively done here is they're making a newer, better console and dropping it for a price less than the price the original Quest had because the Quest never had a price drop. So totally alienating anyone who bought the original quest in the last two months and can no longer return that they're now stuck with the inferior quest and now for me personally i don't feel bad about that because owning the original quest that's that's part of the deal with making content and having and being up on things is like having things that maybe come obsolete and i've had mine for quite a while so i don't feel like i'm a part of that group but i do feel for them because it's so mean <laughs> I feel I'm so glad for the few people who asked me, like, should I get a quest? And I was like, well, I, they're going to announce something in like a month or two. So I would hang on and wait because like that would be so frustrating to have bought one just 
just that recently and find out, oh, guess what? It's the, you're now, yours is now, it's not obsolete, but I mean, the, you, you're now going to be missing out on a lot of these experiences because the original quest isn't going to have the power to run these things. So that's pretty rough that they did that. And I think it definitely just shows again that Facebook doesn't really look out for their consumers. They, they have their agenda and they move forward because like what they could have done they could have price dropped the original quest earlier and then people wouldn't be as mad about this. If people had bought their quest for even $300 and the new one is now $300. But if you paid $400 for a 64 gig last month and you now find out the newer one is $300 and you're stuck with that old one, that'd be really crappy. So that's my rant. There'll be more on the podcast tonight about that, but that's just, that's just crazy. Yeah, it really was. It's playing with people's money. It's yeah. And the fact that they like, they discontinued it not that long ago. Like, they didn't discontinue this several months ago in preparation. They just kind of discontinued this as this one was coming. It's like, what What the heck, man? This guy is still going on. Still going on about how the glasses are going to help you communicate with people in real life in front of each other. That's pretty weird. I don't know if there's any more crazy quest news. What I'm going to try and do... Is I'm gonna try and pull up maybe the Oculus website and just see what's on there to announce and discuss. And then maybe we'll go hop around and see if someone has a if someone has a unboxing or something we can take a look at. <laughs> Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. The Climb 2 looks pretty cool. I haven't even played the Climb 1 yet. Maybe I'll just hold out for the Climb 2. But it looks like you're going to have a lot of newer environments. Population 1, that's already uh, in playtest on Quest. Jurassic World, which we saw, which looks cool. It's kind of cartoon, but I think that'll work really well. Uh, Beat Saber, of course, getting the multiplayer. And then BTS, right? That was the big deal there. Echo VR, we already have had that. If it's going to get the combat update, and you guys can't even see that. If Echo VR is going to get the combat update, then that would be a pretty big deal because they've been waiting on that a while. You could ask it where the hot pockets are. <laughs> now, why would anyone get a Rift S also is like the other. I mean, there's still good things about having a Rift S, but like this is supposed to look even better. It's supposed to have an LCD screen. So this should essentially in every in every way be better. Great idea. I like it. <laughs> now this, this uh, again, this is what's frustrating me right here. I keep having to move this around. You get the Quest 2 Elite Strap, which is a freaking Halo strap. Like which I feel like would be the best way to have this, but like, why didn't you just launch it with this strap? Why make a crap strap and then launch this Elite? They could have even, with battery and carrying case, without the battery and carrying case, they could have put this Elite strap on, made this thing 50 bucks more, and it would have been the right call. And then you got this Fit Pack. They're basically jumping after all of the third-party accessory people and beating them to the punch to where they won't be able to do anything with this. But yet, everyone who buys it is going to need these things. That's frustrating. <laughs> Hang on, can you get the hot pockets? They wanted to hit the 299 price point. I I get that, but the old one was already 400 bucks and it was selling out like mad. At 350, it still would have been a price drop and it would have been worlds better to not have that stupid strap. Ugh. Make extra money from the accessories. Yep. This is going to be like phones here soon. You're going to buy your VR headset and they're going to be like, oh, you need to get this cover with it. You need to get this faster charger with it. You need to get this ba extra battery with it. Like they're just going to, you're going to buy the, the product for cheap, but then they're going to get you on the accessories. Yeah. This dude, I wish I could skip this because he's, I feel like he's gone over the same points like three times here. Apple skipping earbuds in the next iPhone. So, in hopes that folks will buy AirPods. Yep. Uh, I I believe that, Nick. I'm, I would not be surprised at all to see that kind of stuff happen. And we'll, maybe we'll see it creep more into the VR industry. But, like, so far we've been so lucky to not have tons of ads and stuff like this. I feel like Facebook's turning the tide on us. Okay. It looks like this dude's shutting up. So let's see what's about to happen here. 
buy the controller separately. That would be horrible. They did that with the first Oculus, but that's because they weren't out yet. So it looks like this is lining out everything else. So yeah, I think that's pretty much the end of the intro. Why did they have that guy finish all the intro? Like, that was just no, no help. And then the after party with Jaden Smith. <laughs> what a random thing to have him there. So yeah, it's going to move in the developer session. So we're going to stop this here. And I'll see, I'll see if we can find one re Okay, that's a really interesting point. So he's saying basically it's got a big panel here, but it's only using subsections of it. So if you move your lenses, the subsection that it's seeing is then going to move with that. So this whole entire... Yeah, 1 p.m. Pacific. Okay, so they're just they're just doing the setup and everything, it sounds like. So uh, I don't think we'll watch this whole review. I'll probably watch a little bit more just to get a few more questions answered. Uh, yeah buffer space both between the eyes as well as on the outside okay at that point i'm gonna go ahead i think he's just discussing from the rest of this here out so i'm gonna finish up a quick discussion and then end this stream and get ready for the ps5 one so basically everything we've already covered and talked about uh i'm i'm really annoyed <laughs> honestly that they're basically may they're basically giving you like a super cheap base model and then kind of expecting you to upgrade it yourself. I see that they did that to keep the price point down, but seeing that other head strap in action, that should have just been the head strap. They should have never dropped this crappy elastic strap. Like make the thing 350. That's not that much more. It wouldn't have changed how much people are going to buy it. And everyone could have had this. So it's just annoying, but whatever. Uh, the battery pack one interests me more because having a USB-C on the back, that's going to be more expensive, having another head strap with a battery pack. But just being able to move the USB-C port to the back, I feel like it's going to be way better for Link. So that's really interesting. Uh, Nova, I don't know. People are asking about doing that, but I feel, like, I feel like I don't know how to block the sound from being in the live stream. So I feel like it's just going to be a bunch of people talking over the PS5 live stream. I feel like it would be kind of a bad live stream. So I'm not really sure what to do uh, there. Uh, Quest 2, I it looks like I'm going to get it and give you guys my thoughts, but I won't be able to get my hands on it until next month when the consumer launch happens. So for the meantime, we've watched the tested one here. It sounds like Mike at VR Oasis has one. I I like their opinions a lot and i watch them of course go check out uh, mrtv usually always reviews stuff Tyrell wood uh nathy those are all other ones that i i watch from time to time not as much as these two because i just really enjoy their channels but there are others 299 well the thing about it a lot Elias, I don't know if I'm saying that right. $299 would attract more people, but the problem has never been the price with the Quest. It has always been the supply. Even at $400, they were selling out everywhere they ever had them the entire time it's been in existence. So now, unless they have a way better supply line, they're putting it down to $300 and possibly just going to sell out all the time again for a lower price. Like they could have made it the better price, give people a better experience because I imagine they're still going to have a supply problem no matter what they do. I would like to see me, I would like to be proven wrong on that. I would love to find out that no, this thing is great. Uh, they have tons of supply. They've made 10 million of them to start. I doubt that's the case. So I feel like at $300, it's just going to be a fight for everyone to get them anyways. Could this crappy strap be so it's more mobile? I mean, they they said that in the thing so that, oh, you can just put it into a bag easier. No, they did that completely as a price savings, in my opinion, because no one's going to want that strap once they've used it for any time. Someone, Kev Gret says people on Reddit are finding out the battery life is not good. That's really concerning if that's true, because that's going to mean you need to get the strap with the battery in it because the internal battery is not going to last in this one, which I don't like the idea of that, especially because if they're saying already the battery is not doing great to start, uh, batteries only degrade, as you all know from your cell phone. <laughs> the first time you get one, it it works really well. So Thrill said they had a 20 million supply leak. That's pretty good if that's true. If there's really 20 million these ready to be sold, then then we might not see out of stocks at least for six months. I don't know. That's that's hard to believe that they would have 20 million ready. I hope so. But you think about it, we haven't even sold 20 million VR headsets, period. All together. PSVR, Quest, Rift, all of them. We don't believe that there's been 20 million sold yet in the world. We don't have exact numbers. But if they were to have 20 million, then that's, then that's enough that that should hold up to demand. So we'll find out there. Did OG only sell 1 million? I feel like they never, Oculus never releases the freaking numbers for us. 
the only thing that we did know from uh, like Steam surveys and other things that people were analyzing, it did seem that during these last this last year, the Quest was outselling every other headset in the current market. Like more of them were being sold than all the others put together. But of course, that was still way behind the PSVR's five million. Uh, PSVR had sold five million uh, last year. Which I know that for sure because they announced, I think 5.2 million was the last time they announced. So they by far had sold the most. And then it was believed PC VR had sold about another 5 million between all of it. So it's hard to know because a lot of these things don't report numbers, but it does seem like we have a pretty accurate picture of it. So maybe, maybe there's 20 million of these ready to go and 299 is the right price to just get them in everyone's hands because they really just want to get everyone on horizon and on venues and in there because really facebook's plan like everyone's been saying probably is once they're all in there they're going to be making all the money off advertising and software sales they don't have to worry about they don't have to worry about oh making a bunch of money off the headset because if they're advertising to people who are spending all their time in the headset walking around the streets in vr with each other like you do in rec room but like seeing billboards and stuff they're gonna be making so much off ad money they could start giving these things away by next year if if they wanted to. So uh, that's most of my thoughts. Let me know this, this live stream will, it'll probably stay up. I don't know because we've been commenting and kind of watching other people's, there might be some issues. I might have to trim parts out or I might actually have to just take it down. I don't know what's going to happen quite yet. Cause I haven't done this before. I know that it's allowed to be fair use if you're commenting, but like we were commenting through this and I wasn't talking over them the whole time. So I'm not sure how that all works. So we're going to learn together. <laughs> uh, but either way, I want to say thank you, everybody. Uh, if you have any last thoughts you want to get in, get them in the comments right now before I wrap up and we'll we'll talk about any last thoughts. But yeah, I see Nick saying basically the actual price is 430. Yeah, exactly. So is the Valve Index still better than Quest 2? Elias, that's a hard question to answer. Yes, it's still got better tracking. Better controllers. Yes, which I am going to stream the PS thing here in about half an hour, so I need to go scarf down some lunch and get ready for that. Uh, the index still beats it in a lot of ways, but I mean the fact that you can just walk away and have complete wireless ability, even the original Quest versus the Valve in that, in that was like, okay, this is so free, and this one's such good VR that it was hard to like declare an actual winner. For the general population, the Quest 2 will be better for the index than the index for the general population. For a true VR enthusiast, wants the best graphics, the best tracking, complete hand tracking, probably still going to want an index, but for the general population, most people are going to want the Quest. Uh, Rec Room is coming to Xbox. Yeah, I actually, I posted something on Instagram about that yesterday. That's that's really exciting. It's not VR, obviously, but just getting more people in is the thing to do. Yes, I'm planning to stream the PS5 thing in a half an hour, so I'm going to go eat lunch really quick. I think I answered that. Uh, do, do, do. what if they had 2 million quest twos, 2 million wouldn't be enough. I don't think bear, I think 10 million would be enough that we wouldn't see out just raw, but at 299, these things will sell fast. Uh, Oculus Wi-Fi 6 could technically give amazing wireless PC VR. One thing that I will say to anyone who's still out there listening, if you were thinking about buying several of these and selling them as they run out of stock, if there really was 20 million, you probably won't really be able to do that. But I would be surprised if there's 20 million. I'm going to try and look up what you said there about that on Thrillseeker and see if I can find where that information came from. Yeah, Wi-Fi 6 as potentially could give amazing wireless PCR. And they're saying that there is going to be potential to stream directly from your hard drive to the headset for video. So who knows what that means as far as game streaming and what's coming down the road, just like the original quest when it was launched, they didn't tell us there was going to be a link cable and other things they were trying to put in the works. There's probably going to be things about this that are coming and people are going to be like, Oh, I never would have seen that coming, but there's probably several features in this headset that we don't even know they're going to try and make happen. <laughs> Elias, still waiting on your valve index i know a lot of people have been waiting 13 weeks or more for theirs so who knows if you might get yours really soon because people might cancel their index orders because of this news we'll see what happens uh anyways i have got to go eat some lunch and get ready for the next one i know vehicles rec room that's pretty cool that's gonna be cool i'm excited to see where rec room goes to i just wish i noticed the psvr is really starting to struggle to run it lately like things are crashing all the time on psvr when it used to run perfectly so i hope they start to fix some of the crashing issues before they keep doing all these extra updates because we don't want to leave a bunch of headsets in the dust on it so i am going to go eat some lunch thank you so much we have 36 likes on this we are up to over 50 people that's probably the most we've ever had on the stream at once ever so thank you so much for hanging out with me today i've really enjoyed this i 
any any advice you want to throw in the comment section after this video goes up about how to do these things different or better if you would like to see let me know because this is the first time i've ever like streamed an event and i didn't want to be interrupting them the whole time but i felt like it was a little weird myself being muted i don't know let me know what you think i will see you in another reality